and we're going to run into some interesting points as we go into verses 30 and 31 of our passage. So, reading from the New International Version, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Now, as the writer to the Hebrews is working through the history of Israel, and in working through it, showing that faith from the very beginning, from the time of Abel on, it has been faith that generated acceptance with God. He goes into the early days of Israel entering the land of Canaan. And these verses are interesting for several things. The first being Joshua is never mentioned. Now you would, you would think, you know, he, he was the man who led them after Moses died. He led them into the land of Canaan, was with them all the way through. Not a word was mentioned of him in this, in this passage. Now, and I don't think he was slighted in this. I don't think that was the Holy Spirit's intent in that. But I think to show, again, that the faith defined in verse 1 was real for the common man as well as for the great. You know, the notoriety, the, the, the great people of, that we call faith uh, throughout Scripture. He's showing in these verses that the common man and evil women can have faith, and they have the same faith as Noah, Moses, so forth. And I think it's just interesting uh, that this is what gave the common average ordinary individual, uh, and as I said a moment ago, evil women, a right relationship with God. Now, as we look at this first, the, the, the fall of Jericho is recounted. Now, it's obvious that it wasn't strategic power or ability. It was the faith of the people who were told to walk quietly, do not give a war cry, do not raise your voices, do not say a word, Joshua chapter 5, verse 10, until they were to shout victory and see God act. The only sound was the blowing of the ram's horn and the singular view of the ark leading the children of Israel around Jericho. Now, this action certainly didn't make any sense. You kind of wonder, you know, as the people of Jericho had heard about the great Israel coming into the land, and they see this bunch of people with an ark in front of them going around, and no one is even saying a word. Now, can you imagine the howls, the hollers, the, the challenges that were coming from the walls? Quite possibly, because that's what people do in their warfare. They kind of jack themselves up by all the emotion they can generate in themselves as they get ready to launch themselves into battle. At least it was back in that ancient time. And so you kind of wonder, it really just made no sense. It looked awesomely ridiculous, I'm sure, to the people of Jericho. But the question is, why did they do it this way? Certainly Joshua told them, but why did they do it this way? Why, was, why did God tell them, you don't shout, shout, you don't sing songs, you don't say a word for seven days. Now you try to get, you try to get this crowd right here to go seven days without saying a word walking in circles. I mean, you know, we would be hard pressed, you know what I'm saying? Now just imagine this army. Why did God tell them to do it this way? Certainly, it certainly was a psychological impact upon the people of Jericho. Yep. Right. Yeah. 
And I, and I think so. I think, I think the psychological impact on the people of Jericho, I think the psychological, spiritual impact on the nation of Israel, God was wanting the, the Israelites as well as the Canaanites to know, I'm doing this. Israel is not doing this. I'm doing this. Because in chapter 7 of, of Exodus, when Achan, you know, the whole city was dedicated. You don't, you know, you burn everything, destroy everything, except the gold and silver, you bring that to the, to the temple. It, it was a dedication uh, to the Lord. And Achan stole the wedge of gold in the Babylonian garment. And the Lord let him know that I did this. And because you're not following my word, Israel was defeated in the next battle. So I, I think that's, you know, that's why. Now, got a question that comes up with this. And I don't know if you've ever encountered this before. But I have ran into it in my years of life. Does God still tell people to do stupid stuff? Supposedly, if you got faith, you know. Does God still tell people? Because this was awesomely ridiculous. Is it stupid to God? Hmm? Is it stupid to God? Okay. It might seem stupid to us, but is it stupid to God? So, so that's... That example is like, okay, this don't seem like the norm, and what we, we really do this, and, you know, we stop and think, So, yes, he does. Other ideas? Does God still tell us to do stupid stuff? It seems stupid to us. Okay. It's obviously not stupid to him. Okay. So here's the point. How do we know God is telling us to do this? I remember, and I'll give you a an example of a very young Christian doing something really stupid but believing it was because God told him. Okay? Now, I was a teenager. 17 years old, I think. Vaguely. There's not many things I remember from them, but I do remember this called, probably because it was so stupid now looking back on it. I'm going down the road driving Driving my little, uh, I think we had a had a Ford had a Ford Falcon, Ford Falcon back then. Here I'm going down the road, and you know, had my Bible up on the dashboard because I'm being all spiritual and everything. And I felt like the Lord was telling me, if I trust Him, I can close my eyes and pray as I'm driving down. A back road. I'm not talking about the main highway. I'm talking about the back road. So here I'm going down the road. Lord, I and Lord, I you know. Did God tell me to do that? Does God tell us to do stupid stuff? Now I've all heard. I've heard you say yes. Does God tell us to do stupid? What's? How do we know the difference? That's that's the point. How do we know the difference? Faith. Now I believed I could do that. Yeah. Did you? I did. I, I closed my eyes for a little bit and prayed a little bit, opened them up real quick, see what I'd be sure I wasn't driving, running off the road. And you know. Like I said. Yeah. Yeah. I I I've been a dork most of my life, you know. I mean. But I I think and this is where I think young Christians fall into this. Those of us who have matured. Now, if the Lord tell me now, you got to go. I'd say, you want to explain that to me before I do that? I'm doing 80 miles an hour down, you know, 40. I ain't, you know. Uh, I got enough problem with trying to stay on the road as it is. I think the thing that comes about it, because I've read where 
preachers tell people to you know do do crazy things i've read of some cases in africa where the, where the preacher told them to get rid of their evil spirits they had to, they had to eat snakes now you know and it was all in faith you believe god and you eat this snake and it's going to you know and we have snake handlers here in america in the mountains if you have faith you can handle rattlesnakes you can drink poison yeah and, and, and it won't hurt you if you have faith. Now, if you die, it's because you didn't have enough faith. You know, okay, how do I get it real quick to keep from? But there's churches that practice this up in the hills. So how do we know the difference? Does God tell us to do stupid stuff? Yeah, I guess he does. But how do we distinguish between Stuff that God tells us to do. And stuff that we come up with in our minds. Out of our emotions. That. Well I, I think I need to you know. Go jump off the top of the church. God told me to do this. Yeah, Satan told Jesus to do the same thing. And he even quoted scripture to him, you know. How do we know the difference? I'd say whatever lines up with the word of God, I know that uh, the scripture said that things that were written before were written for our example. So um, just understanding the nature of the relationship between God and people, how we will instruct them to do things that might seem uh, out of the ordinary. Don't tempt the Lord, you know. And I was flat tempting going down Dry Fork Road, a little curvy road, you know. I was certainly tempted by that. I think that, yes, he does. But the thing that helps us distinguish between what we, we feel we should do and what God tells us we should do, Moses thought he should hit the rock the second time, you know. God told him to hit it the first time. He just told him to speak to it the second time. And that's what cost Moses his reward of entering into Canaan. Because he hit the rock. The difference is who gets the glory. In the case here, in, as recounted in Hebrews and in Exodus, it was clear the walls came down because of God it wasn't because of the strategic you know ability of the people of Israel and I think when we feel like God is telling us to do something that really does not make sense to us I'm not saying we should ignore that but at the same time who's going to get the glory now me driving down the road that would have been I got faith I do have faith. I'm good. I got faith. Do you have enough faith to do that? I got faith. Who's getting the glory out of that? Me. God didn't get the glory out of that. I got the glory out of that. So, who's going to get the glory? Jesus told the Pharisees that, you know, you stand on the side of the corners of the streets and raise your hands up praying. He said, you already got your reward. You're doing it for yourself. You're not doing it for me. So does God still tell us to do stupid stuff? Yeah, I think he tells us things that we look at and say, I, I don't know that I can do that. But one of the ways to help sift that, to see if it is God, who's going to get the glory out of it? And I think, you know, once again, for us mature Christians, it may not be that big an issue. But you will run into people, if you haven't already, and especially young Christians that may have, you know, well, if you believe, you gotta, you know, no, no.
Yeah. Yeah. Once again, who's, who's going to get the glory out of this? You know, and I, yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. Who's, who's going to get the glory out of, out of all of that that came out of it? The Lord got the glory, even though you did some things that, you know, and we all have done that. Maybe it wasn't all that, looking back, wasn't all that intelligent, you know. Um, and God does use things. But I think it's important for us to really, you know, ask the question, who's going to get the glory out of this? Now, certainly Israel was encouraged. Israel was built up and strengthened in their belief in God out of this. I'm, I'm sure of that. It didn't stop Achan from sinning. I mean, you know. But at the same time, if God is leading you to step out, then you want to weigh carefully, who's going to get the glory if I step out in this? Is this something I'm doing so that I can be impressive? Or is this something that God is wanting me to do that he will be impressive? And, you know, it's not like... Uh, Kelly said, it's, it's sometimes it's not real simple, but I think we have to weigh that just so that we don't end up doing things that embarrass ourselves, embarrass the church, or embarrass the testimony of God. Interesting as you look at this. But the second thing that comes out of this verse that's maybe even more surprising than the fact that Joshua was not mentioned and God was telling them to do something that looked really stupid uh, was the faith of the prostitute Rahab and her faith is described in her discussion with the spies back in Joshua chapter 2 verses 8 through 13 uh, she, she tells the spies that she believes you know she's heard and, and she believes this and it's interesting that some commentators have tried to rename her and say that she was an innkeeper that the word can be translated as an innkeeper. But in most every usage, even in the, in the Old Testament days, the use of this term was associated with an innkeeper that had a little something on the side going on. That's how they made the money. And almost every reference to Rahab in Scripture includes the title prostitute or harlot. And it's interesting that the history of her life clung to her even into the New Testament, right here, the prostitute Rahab. So, once again, we talk about in, in our class, you know, the consequences of, of, our, of our lives. You do things, sometimes things just kind of dog you from their own. And so it was with Rahab, who she had been, clung to her in, you might could say, part of her historical reputation. But she was assimilated into the nation of Israel. She became part of the, of the Messianic line. So it wasn't that she continued in sin, but who she was kind of hung to her. And it's interesting that what you have been may continue to dog you in people's knowledge. And there are some people who will continue to throw up what you were like before, you know. It's kind of like um, there's a person I used to work with when I worked for the county. 
And I ran into her after some years and, and told her, you know, what I was doing and where I'm going to church and, and told her who was pastoring here. And she said, Matt Rummage is a pastor? I said, yeah. And you could tell by the look on her face, I cannot believe that happened. <laughs> now, she didn't go into any details. She rode, he rode with them back and forth to college. That was, that was the extent of her knowledge of him. So it was things that he said and did on the road back and forth to college. Uh, of one of the, what, three or four colleges that he went to before the Lord finally got his attention. I'll hear about that later, you know. I'll hear about that. Yeah, 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 he, he was. He'll tell you that. He'll tell you that. But, you know, sometimes things just continue to hang on you. She, she couldn't get past the fact of whatever Matt appeared to be her before that he was now a preacher. It just, she couldn't hardly get past that. Look at Saul. Look at Saul. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I mean, he loved to kill people. Yeah. <laughs> he made up a little bit of a You're going to be dead in a minute, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, I can save you now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, things, things kind of hang, hang on you, but the important thing to remember is that it isn't what people think of you, but what God knows about you that is important. We can't undo who we may have been. Can't go back and undo that. You can't sweep it under the rug. You can't whatever. It is somebody knows. And you can't undo that. And that may be a thorn or a plague or a haunt that hangs over you. But the important thing to remember is that God saw her as a woman of faith. James uses her in his epistle as an example of what true faith does. It changes a person. That's what he brings out about her there. So Rahab was saved. Now, let me ask you this. Because she's called this all through Scripture, was she a saved prostitute? In other words, did she keep on practicing? No. Not a practicing, yeah. No, I, I don't think she was, because if she had, the condemnation that Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 17 brings out would have been applied to her by Israel. She'd have been burnt. She'd have been killed. So the name stuck, but the practice didn't. You may not be able to keep the name from sticking, but you don't have to practice. You don't have to be what people may think of you. And uh, she wasn't a practicing prostitute. I'm, and in studying this, I thought back, what was it in the 80s? We had hookers for Jesus. You remember that one? Time Magazine. Time Magazine cover. Hookers for Jesus. No. James is clear. You come to Jesus Christ, your life changes you don't sanctify prostitution any more than you sanctify drug use or sanctify murder or sanctify go around down the line. You change. So that's it, you know, it's just interesting as you look into this, the questions that come up and the things that instead of we read through Hebrews eleven and just go right through it sometimes, but if we take a few minutes and really think about it, it's it's a lot of interesting stuff here. But he goes on in verse 32. And he says, what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. Who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised. Who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword. Whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign enemies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. You know, 
In other words, he's, he's, he gets to this verse and he says, do I really need to keep going with this? You know, the point's been made. People that I'm writing to, I could tell you and keep on going. And he goes down the list of really three basic periods of Israel's life. The period of the judges, as he talks about Gideon and Jephthah, the monarchy, David, and Samuel, and then the prophets. And he said, I, I can go on with this. I didn't run out of examples, but do I really need to keep going? And as we look at this list, not all of these guys were, were great examples. Some of them did some foolish things. Jephthah made a rash promise. You remember Jephthah? In the battle with the, with the enemies of Israel, he made a promise to God, if you give me the victory, I will sacrifice to you the first thing I see. Remember who the first thing was he saw? His daughter. And so, once again, did God tell him to do this? No. Did he do some stupid stuff? Yes. He made a rash promise. It was sincere. It was innocent. It was genuine. But he made a promise. And he didn't, he didn't kill her. But she never got married. Never had a family. That was the sacrifice. So, you know, there were flaws in some of these guys, these people. But they also are included to show that it's not sinless perfection that causes one to be right with God. As Paul says in Romans 5, 1, we are justified by faith and we have peace with God. Now, we have to notice here something that comes out of this. As the writer goes down and gives this list of people from the various points of uh, Israel's history, we have to remember, he's not using fables. He's not using fairy tales or mythological stories. He's referring to real people, real events, and real faith. You know, we can, you know, if you're going to relate a story, a myth, a fable, how's that going to really work when things get really tough? He's not talking about myths and fables. He's talking about real people, real events that happen. Scripture is the inspired word of God. The, the Bible is not a book which requires updating by social construct. It is the word of God to mankind, and it's as relevant right now as it was the day it was written. And in verses in verse 33 through 35, 10 results of faith are given in those little verses. 10 results, all showing the victorious power of God. And verse 35 includes women. Women as equally faithful and rewarded for it. So it's interesting as you know, we hear people attack scripture now that it's a male dominated thing. We got, to, we got to change the genders in the Bible because you know, Men are the ones that wrote this, and they all wrote God the Father. We need to have God the Mother or God the non-binary or, or whatever. It's interesting that in this chapter, we have at least three women that are pointed out as having as great a faith as any of the men. So just, you know, a little side there for what we hear in our day. But then in verse 35, there's an abrupt change. All the way through, up into this verse, we've heard, you know, victory, victory, God-led, faith in David, all that. And he goes down and gives a list of ten things as he wraps that part up. But then he says in verse 35, others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskin and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. And the point 
that he's bringing out, and I think he's leading up to what he's going to be talking about in chapter 12, is that faith doesn't always result in a victorious end that is seen in this life. Faith makes one right with God. Faith can be an ingredient in which God does things through us with victory. But at the same time, not always does faith cause us to have a victorious end in this life. You look at that list of things. Look at, you know, nobody's name is given here. We can apply names to them because some of the examples that he refers to are fairly evident. Daniel, the three Hebrews, you know, others, things like this. But look at what, you know, these, these were average believers, if you want to call them that. Average believers or nobodies. But they had the same faith as Moses. They had the same faith as Noah. There's no differentiation in the quality of faith that is talked about in these verses with these folks. These were the others. You know, there's no average or unknown believer to God. We all mean something to him. Why? Because of faith. And look at what they received for their faith. Torture, jeers, flogging, chained, imprisoned, stoned, sawed in two. They went about in sheepskin and goatskins, not because they were flaunting spirituality, but that's all they had to wear. They were destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground by faith by faith so now of course this is obviously due to their sin right or their failure to believe which would have then given them a more glorious life right we live in a name it and claim it If you have enough faith, you can be healed. If you have enough faith, you can be wealthy. If you have enough faith, you can, you know, all this. You hear it on television every day in some form. If you listen to those religious channels. No. They didn't have this because they were lacking. Look at what he says. The world, verse 38, was not worthy of them. It wasn't because they had sinned. It wasn't because they didn't have enough faith. One commentator says they were worth more than the whole world, though they lacked everything. So, of course, some might say today, well, if they had chosen to believe and be rich and cared for, and have houses and stuff, they would have had that if they had chosen. No. The author is clear. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Verse 39. So now, what does that say to you? Talk to me about the power of those words. Is that encouraging? Is it discouraging? What, what, I'm rocking the boat there. Um, what does that say to you?
They had spiritual victory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had faith enough to lose it all because they saw something better. As it says in back in chapter 10. They had faith enough to lose. Now that's a challenge to us today. Do we have faith enough that something comes up tomorrow and all of a sudden we've lost? Maybe something comes up, you have a you know accident, some sickness takes place, something comes up that just, you know, it just sucks all that you were depending on. Not that that dependence was evil, but all that you were depending on to make it through life. Your savings, you know, your investments, things like this. All of a sudden, something happens. Do we have enough faith? Enough faith. Do we have faith that we can see something better even though we lose it all? That's a challenge to us in these verses. We are living in a time when people are beginning to lose it all because they're Christians. Now it's more virulent and vicious in other countries, but it's beginning to grow here. And it's coming. Regardless of the elections, it's coming. Yeah, it's the Lord is shaping things up, and it's it's just it's just interesting. You know, we we think you know, the Lord's coming, and all of a sudden we think it's way out. All of a sudden, whoa, the Lord's coming! You know, because it's right here in our face. Things are happening at such a rate. You've exercised, you've exercised the faith for it because, you know, you look at this, this what, they, what they experienced in this list. Eleven different things happened to these people, to these others that we don't even know necessarily all their names. But they lost it all because they saw something better. Do we live day by day seeing something better that will help us get through that day, help us get through that situation, help us to face loss, difficulty, problems. Do we see something better? Do we see beyond it that God is in control? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, was still really, really bad. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, do we, do we see something better in our lives? Yeah, we, you know, we, we want to work our jobs. We want to have a retirement. We want to have this. We, we, nothing wrong with any of that. But at the same time, do we have or look or work for all that, seeing something better that if in particular you are challenged that you're going to lose it all if you keep this stupid faith thing going, belief in God and all this other junk, you're going to lose it all. Can we see something better? We have to be able, and, I, and I'm not saying that I'm perfect in this at all, but we all, this passage challenges us that every day we need to live thinking and seeing something better. Remember, they didn't receive the promise. They died not receiving the promise of the fullness of salvation brought by Jesus Christ. They saw something better ahead in prof through prophets, through the word of God given. They saw this and they believed it. And they saw something that was better so that they, if they lost it here, not that it was, oh, yay, I've lost it all. No, no, they didn't do that. But they said, I will not give up my faith. I will not surrender my relationship. I will not deny my Lord. Because there's something better. In their case, something better was coming. In our case, something better has happened. And if you want to look at it definitely, something more better, something more better is coming. The return of Jesus Christ. And as things speed up on us in world events and things that are happening, and we begin to see more and more scripture, it looks like it's being fulfilled. Are we really having this as an anchor for our soul? I think that's the challenge out of, out of this. And it's just, it's just very, you know, the emphasis on the heroes of faith continuing, even though they never saw the fullness of salvation through Jesus, is the type of perseverance that the author talked about in chapter 10, verse 36. He said to them, then you need to have patience. You need to persevere. These, th these are examples of that persevering. Uh, Jesus is coming back. Chapter 9, verse 28 says he's going to return. But he hasn't come yet. And we have to have the same type of perseverance that he hadn't come. And the world at the same time is a marvel and is an enemy. But don't lose hope. Don't lose assurance. We have to persevere. Look at what he says as he wraps up the chapter, our chapter 11, verse 40. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Why did they not receive it and see it? Because it wasn't God's time. Lord, you want me to go through all this simply because it's not fitting into your time frame? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. None of the Old Testament believers experienced the full full salvation provided in Christ Jesus. And you know, once again, it's easy to read this and just kind of jump over it. But none received the promised Christ of Genesis three fifteen. Thousands of years had passed. And they hadn't seen it yet, except. They saw it in faith that there was coming a deliverer. And the plan that is now working and is speeding to its final conclusion provides that they with us will be made perfect. 
at the rapture, resurrection of all believers will be provided an entrance into the fullness of salvation given in these last days. We will have spiritual and physical regeneration. They will not be left out. Dead in Christ, Paul says, shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. And I'll wrap it up with chapter 8, verse 13 tells us the law is obsolete now. But what made a person right then is the same thing that makes a person right now. Faith in God. Faith in Him. And we'll pick up in chapter 12 next week.